Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Women's Center Presents Speaking Out Against Rape, the history of women of color in the movement to end sexual violence. Our program will begin now. The Women's Center's mission statement is supporting survivors of violence and promoting a safer community in Southern Illinois. Carbondale United, who collaborated with the Women's Center for this event today, mission statement is, the mission of Carbondale United is to provide an avenue of healing and community safety through the following, awareness, education, activism, our goals are to eliminate gun violence and end racism from our neighborhoods and to provide events that are inclusive and diverse. Our agenda today, we're here for a pre-recorded training done by the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault, ICASA, Training Institute. There will be a time for Q&A at the end of the program. Please use the chat or Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen for any questions. Now I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Hello, everybody. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and present this for you today. Um, I'm going to dive right in. I'm very excited to share this topic with you. And I have to begin by telling you kind of how this webinar came to be and a little bit about my own story and journey. Because for almost 20 years now, I have been training on the history of the anti-rape movement for ICASA and other places. And I have always told folks that our movement began in the mid-60s during the Civil Rights Movement. And I haven't learned anything that's necessarily incorrect about that, but certainly things I have learned in the past year in my own research have really unveiled to me my own oversight in accurately portraying the history of our movement. And one of the primary sources that I want to share with you today is a book called At the Dark End of the Street by Danielle L. McGuire. It was published in 2010, and earlier in the year when I decided that I was going to revise some of the materials and particularly the history portion of our presentation at ICASA, I decided to try to look and include more experiences of women of color. Well, that was a great awakening for me as I found this book by Danielle McGuire at the dark end of the street. Danielle tells the story of the civil rights movement that includes the history of black anti-rape activism, um, an anti-rape activism that I'd never known exists before. Um, so after reading McGuire's persuasive retelling of the civil rights movement and including those stories of women of color, I just became painfully aware of my own glaring omission in my presentations um, at our movement. And, the lack of inclusion of the stories of women of color um, who for decades before our movement was formally organized had been risking their lives and telling their stories. Um, and I have a new appreciation for imagining their surprise in the 60s when suddenly white women um, started standing up and telling them it was time for them to speak out. Um, and the truth is that they've been speaking out for decades at great sacrifice and great cost. So I committed myself uh, on, on completion of reading the book to doing more research and um, I'm still in the process of doing that, but it's never too late to begin to start to correct um, my uh, oversight. And so this webinar is sort of my small overdue effort to try to right that wrong. So I want to give credit to Daniel McGuire as a primary source, but certainly um, all the other people out there who have 
trying to keep the history, and it is available now thanks to the internet. You can find a lot of it yourself. So I think that it's time for us to start rewriting history. So let's move ahead and do that um, starting today. You really cannot talk about rape in the United States without addressing the issue of slavery. So looking at our own history in this country and how we subdued slaves with the use of threats and acts of violence so that we could bring them into the country for labor, we have to recognize that sexual violence has always been a part of our history. Um, and that, that sexual violence obviously is completely intertwined with the system of privilege and oppression. So we can't talk about rape in our country without speaking of slavery. Before the Civil War, the rape of slaves was common, it was legal. Lynching and rape were the weapons that were used daily to keep slaves in their place, men and women. During the war, soldiers raped women of all races across the South, but especially black women. Women have always been the spoils of war. The invasion and colonization of nations throughout history, and our nation is no different, has always included invading lands that belong to other people, claiming the property of those lands and the bodies of their women as their own. That's the history that this country is based on. After the war, after the Civil War, many white men tried to regain control over blacks through continued lynching and through continued raping of black women. But what we know is that these slaves, throughout the history of their slavery, did assert their rights, did try to assert to protect themselves, and they did speak out. Um, and even as former slaves began to assert their newfound freedom, rape continued to be a weapon of terror to suppress that freedom. So we have to recognize and begin our conversation there. I will next include, just briefly, I, I speak about Angelina and Sarah Grimke in the history that I do for ICASA, and I wanted to include them today because they have been influential for my own journey. Um, so I'll just tell you briefly about them. Angelina and Sarah Grim Grimke were raised in an all-white, upper-class, slave-holding family. They were sisters. Um, their family was along, among the wealthiest and most elite in Charleston in the 1830s. And, of course, they were raised with slaves. And when Sarah and her sister reached the age of six, they were both given their first slaves of their very own, which they found as a very odd thing. They didn't really know what to do with this other person that they had been given. Um, and of course, as children, what they did was create friends with these children, other children. Sarah would secretly teach slaves, um, her own slave, her quote-unquote own slave, and others to read. And of course, she and the slaves were severely punished um, by this. And in, in fact, um, her slave was severely punished when it was discovered. Her, her slave's name was Hetty, I believe, H-E-T-T-Y, um, and Hetty was severely beaten after it was discovered by um, other people that Sarah was teaching her to read, and eventually died of complications that resulted from the injuries of that beating. Of course, Sarah really suffered greatly, too, for her outspoken um, resistance against slavery, but she did not sacrifice her life, of course, as a woman of color. Um, but the slaves certainly did. So, this Grimke sisters really learned at an early age about the wrongs and the violence involved with slavery. And as they became more and more outspoken, they were eventually banished from their families and from Charleston completely. They moved to Philadelphia in the 20s, and they joined the Quakers and began speaking publicly about slavery. And they recognized when they were speaking about slavery that sexual assault and the rape of the women was a part of keeping that, that system of slavery intact. So I say that to say that there were certainly some white people of good conscience who were speaking out about that, and certainly the Grimke sisters were one or a couple of those folks. They eventually moved to New York and they continued to argue publicly against slavery um, for years. I mention them because they're an education for me personally, because the more I learn of their sacrifices, risking their relationships with their families, their own well-being, their place in society, a safe home, um, you know, again, nothing to compare to the sacrifices of people of color who are literally losing their lives. But when I think about the sacrifices they made, 
I think, what am I willing to do? What would I have been willing to do? And I'm not sure that I would have had the bravery and courage that they had, but I think that's a question that I've been asking myself a lot. Um, and then as I lived through this last year in our own history, yeah, I start asking myself, what should I be doing? Look at the sacrifices people made before me, and what am I doing now? We're in a very similar time in this age today, and I'll be making some comparisons as we go through this. So the Grimke sisters were important in my own journey, but nothing really emphasizes the complete control that slavery really gave men, and I'm speaking mainly of white men, over the bodies of women of color, as the Missouri Celia of 1855 case did. And in the past, I have mentioned this case when I've talked about the history, but I think it, I've essentially said what you see on the screen. This was a case in which a black slave woman was declared to be the property of her owner with no right to defend herself. While that is essentially the impact, I think that Celia's story bears being told, or at least mentioned in a little more detail. Celia was a 16-year-old slave on a Missouri farm for five years her owner made a nightly trek to her slave quarters where he took her to the field and raped her for five years. During that time, she bore two children. In 1855, she fell in love with another slave, and he became jealous of her owner, who he called the old man, and he demanded that she quit him. Their conflict over this kind of reached um, a peak when she found out that she was pregnant and he did not know, of course, whether he was the father or the slave owner was the father. So she demanded that Celia stop contact with this man, that she quit him. So in desperation and fear and confusion, one night, late one night on June 23, 1855, she told her, would tell a reporter later that she didn't know what happened. The devil got into her that night. Um, she took a club to him and uh, when he came to her, when the owner came to her cabin that night and took her into the fruit fields and the trees behind their cabins where he routinely raped her, she had um, kind of stashed a club behind the trees and she took a club and beat him over the head and killed him. Then she later burned his body in a fire pit. She called on her slave boyfriend George to help her dispose of the body. Um, but certainly the his body was discovered, he was missing, his body was discovered, um, and of course they pretty quickly um, arrested Celia about this um, crime and she was prosecuted fully. Um, she was very quickly um, convicted of first degree murder, but she never confessed that George had helped her in any way. So think of this 16 year, no, I'm sorry, 19 year old slave um, who has been enslaved her whole life and she's been raped by this middle-aged man and now threatened by her boyfriend that if you don't stop this that I will leave you and by the way you might be carrying my child but of course we don't know that. Um, none of that mattered of course. Celia was convicted. Um, the judge declared that as his property the owner had a right to do with him whatever he wanted to do and that his rape of her did not count. While waiting execution, she gave birth to a stillborn child, and she was consequently hung on December 21st, 1855. I think that story deserves to be told. I think Celia's story deserves to be told. I don't quite know why we don't honor her. Why is it that we don't honor her? Let's look ahead. Ten years later, the Memphis Massacre of 1866. Again, I've mentioned this in passing in my presentations, but again, I think the story bears repeating. These are women who were speaking out about their rape. During, you have to recognize what's going on in the country in 1816, 1866. The Civil War is over. Uh, Reconstruction has begun, and following the Civil War and Reconstruction, the KKK was really exerting their control to you know, try to regain equilibrium and power for white people over people of color. So lynchings were at an all-time high. The rape of women were at an all-time high. People's homes were being burned. Um, churches were being burned, all with impunity. Impunity while whites, you know, ignited 
um, inferior after um, the conclusion of the Civil War when their slaves were being freed. An incident arose in Memphis, Tennessee during this time after a shooting between a white police officer and some black soldiers um, fresh home from the war. Um, mobs of white civilians and policemen ran through and rampaged black neighborhoods. They killed 46 black people, raped five women. Um, 16-year-old Lucy Smith was a former slave, and her friend Frances Thompson, who was an elderly woman, ended up being two of those victims. 16-year-old Lucy Smith was a slave all of her life. Um, she lived with an older woman. Seven men, including two police officers, broke in and raped them. They came in, this is of interest, they asked them for a meal and some women to sleep with. They had been out rioting and rampaging and burning black neighborhoods, and they paused to come in and ask these two black women for a meal and some sex, reflecting the prevailing thought at a time that black women were really unable to resist, that they were really nothing more than lewd and loose women who enjoyed illicit sex. Um, but amazingly, in the public attention that followed these riots, um, a congressional hearing was held, and this 16-year-old Lucy Smith and her, and her friend both testified before Congress about their assaults. Um, so this was what we kind of glance over quickly in our history and say, oh, and by the way, in 1866 is the first documentation we have of people speaking out against rape. Well, I think it's important to know that these women were women of color who were testifying in front of Congress in 1866 and taught as slaves, former slaves. So imagine these completely disenfranchised former slaves, people of color, still don't even have you know complete freedom and liberty, and they are brave enough in front of a congressional body and share the stories of what happened to them. Um, of course, despite those testimony, no charges were ever filed against them. In fact, no charges were ever filed in the Memphis Massacre of, massacre of 1866. And I would, I would wage, wager a bet that not many people even know about the Memphis Massacre, not even probably the people who live in Memphis. I grew up an hour from there, and I never knew of it um, until several years ago. So this should be, a, you know, a, we of all people within this movement, we need to include this in our history. So why is this omitted from our history? For, you know, why was 1890s black women clubs mo removed from our history? Why do we not talk about that? These black women's organizations were spawned in the late 19th century and early 20th century um, as an alternative to white women's, women's club movements. Um, the difference is that white women were of course, largely middle class, and they were organized largely around cultural and educational events and gathering social events. Um, women of color, on the other hand, were more interested at the time in organizing for social and political change because their lives were at stake. When African American club women began to get involved in anti-lynching campaigns, then they began to also testify about the rape and abuse against black women. I think this is a significant omission, not only in the history of our movement, but in the history of the women's movement in general. And Chicago is a central part of this early black club women's movement. Um, many, there were many famous club women, some that we've heard of, some that we haven't, Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman, Anna Julia Cooper, Mary McLeod Bethune, Mary Terrell, uh, who was the first president of the, one of the black clubs. Um, these women were making the connections long before our movement was ever around. And again, imagine the surprise for women of color in the 60s when white women started standing up talking about breaking the silence um, and making change and speaking out, um, when the reality is that black women had been doing it for decades. Hundreds of black women's clubs were organized, and eventually hundreds of them organized and merged into the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, largely in response to Ida B. Wells' anti-lynching campaigns. So anti-lynching activists included anti-rape activists in 1890, anti-rape activists who were making the connections. Ida B. Wells Barnett, 
spoke to hundreds of black women as they marched on Lyric Hall in New York City on October 5, 1892. The primary focus of her speech was to address the rape of helpless Negro girls. She was a gun-toting editor of the Memphis Free Press. The paper was called The Free Speech and Headlight. She was a journalist, she was a suffragist, and she was an anti-lynching activist who later co-founded the NAACP, although she subsequently broke from them years later because they were not activist enough for her. Um, in the speech that she presented in 1892, she said, white men accuse black men of rape as part of a larger system of intimidation designed to keep blacks subservient and submissive. White men use the protection of white women as an excuse to justify their own barbarism. So she is considered the mother of intersectionality, 1892. Isn't that interesting? Because I thought for sure this movement created that. I thought for sure California created that just a few years on the West Coast, a few years ago on the West Coast. I mean, this is buzzwords that we use now as if we invented them. When you know, people long before us, people of color before us were talking about this. Also, a little side point on Ida B is that in 1881, almost 100 years before Rosa Parks, I refused to give up her seat on a train. She subsequently sued the railroad and, and won a large settlement. Um, not surprisingly, as an activist um, of her nature, a gun-toting activist, she was run out of Memphis and eventually relocated to Chicago. Um, where she became very active. Eventually, another little side note, 1930, she ran for the Illinois State Senate and lost, and then she eventually died in 1931. Another side note here is that Ida B. Wells was in conflict, as we know, like many other um, activists and suffragists were, they were in conflict over the passage, uh, Ida B. and Susan B. Anthony were in conflict over the passage of the 15th Amendment that gave black men the right to vote because it did not include women. And Susan B. Anthony supported that. And Ida B. Wells did not want to support any amendment that did not include women of color. So uh, the resentment is building back in 1892 between women of color and suffragists that, as we know, bleeds into our movement today. Um, also, Ida B. Wells established the first black kindergarten in, kinder in uh, Chicago. So a lot of things we really um, why is she not on any money, or why is her story and her experience and her contributions not, why are they not honored? The Chicago World's Fair was a big event. I think it's worth noting because at the Chicago World's Fair, right here in Illinois, um, there was a large gathering of club women that included Fanny Barrier Williams and Anna Julia Cooper, who told a very large audience about the shameful facts that were happening around the country to the still unprotected women of the South. Um, Fanny Barrier Williams spoke out, Anna Julia Cooper spoke out. So just to be clear, in the late part of the 1890s and the early 1900s, individual black women were regularly standing up and denouncing sexual violence. And these efforts were really laying the groundwork for future organized activism um, for, you know, against the rape of women and certainly the rape of women of color. So skipping ahead just a little bit, and this is pretty much where Danielle McGuire books kind of begins. Um, in the 40s and 50s, Reconstruction has pretty much faded away, and the Jim Crow era is in full-fledged momentum. What we fail to recognize, and what Danielle McGuire makes clear to us in her book, is that many civil rights campaigns of the 50s and 60s had their roots in organized resistance to sexual assault and pleas for justice for black women that had been going on for decades and that was just growing and beginning to galvanize in the black community in the 40s and 50s. But yet, again, the analysis of sexual violence rarely appears in the histories of the civil rights movement. But yet, it's only presented as a struggle between white men and black men. So that story needs to be, history needs to be retold. On the front pages of black newspapers all throughout the 40s and 50s, black women were testifying about sexual assault, sexual harassment, sexual intimidation um, on public buses and in various other places. 
There were many instances of crimes of hate and violence against them. And in the decades leading up to the Civil Rights Movement, there were a series of pretty large-scale rape cases that involved assaults against black women that did get quite a bit of attention. And I want to just talk about them as briefly as I can, but I think these stories deserve to be noted and included in our history. One of the things that black women started doing as they began getting involved in the civil rights movement in the early, early 40s, speaking out against lynching, speaking out against the way women of color and others were treated on the buses, in order to reclaim their bodies and humanity, they called upon a tradition, a long-standing tradition of testimony and storytelling and truth-telling um, that goes back to the days of slavery, really. And there was a case in Little Rock, Arkansas, 1942, a rape of 19-year-old Rosalie Cherry by two police officers. And at the time, Daisy Bates was a branch leader of NAACP in Little Rock, and she was known as a go-to person for issues of sexual violence and rape. After the rape of 19-year-old Rosie Lee Cherry, Daisy Bates, who again, similarly to what we saw in Memphis, she ran a local newspaper and they were not able to, though they were not able to, they argued in the newspaper for justice for Rosalie Cherry, but they were not able to get that and they didn't really expect that. But what she said, what, what Daisy Bates said is, if we can't get justice, we have to at least tell their stories. We have to keep their truths alive. So she published article after article about this in the local paper in Little Rock, publishing pictures of the police officers, um, keeping that story alive in the press. Now that never got that case never got justice, but it did get attention. It did create protests in the streets. Black people were protesting in the streets. You can see one of the pictures on the screen in front of you. Now I just want to say that I was raised in Arkansas during this time. I studied Arkansas history. I worked in the movement in Arkansas. I worked in the anti-rape movement. I have heard of Daisy Bates' name briefly connected to the civil rights movement, but I had no idea that she was an anti-rape activist. That matters. That makes a difference. That deserves to be she, in 1942 in Little Rock, was putting people on notice in her community and alerting white officials that the rape of black women would not go unnoticed. We may not be able to get them justice, but people are going to hear about it. She helped to push the response. She was actually able to get a number of trials and even a few very rare convictions. This is in 1940s in Arkansas. I think that's an important story to be told. Now I want to take you to a story similar, 1944, Abbeville, Alabama, late one evening. A 24-year-old woman, Reese Taylor, she's a married woman of two, married, yeah, married woman, mother of two. She's walking with a friend of hers and her friend's adult son. They're walking home from a church service. A carload of young white men stop them. They're armed with knives and guns. They accuse Reese of being the girl that cut that white boy up. They think she looked like someone who just committed a crime. Does that sound familiar to anything going on today? Despite the protest of Reese and the other people, the men insisted that they were to take her to the sheriff where she would see justice. She tried to run away, but they threatened to kill her, and the friend and the son that were with her pleaded with her to go ahead or that they would kill her. So they were able to rest, wrestle her into the car, where, of course, they took her down to an old tractor pack, path in the woods told her, act like you do with your husband or we're going to cut your throat, and took turns raping her. When they were done, they dressed her, they blindfolded her, and they drove her back to the main road where they dumped her. A few days after that, the phone rang in an NAACP branch office in Montgomery, Alabama, and guess who answered the phone? Rosa Parks, 1944. Rosa Parks was known at the time as the best NAACP investigator they had. They referred to her as the best anti-rape civil rights activist that we have. They sent Rosa Parks to Abbeville to follow up, find out what was going on in the Reese Taylor case to try to get some justice there. She ended up organizing the Alabama Committee for Equal Justice, which launched what the Chicago Defender called at the time 
the largest and strongest campaign for equal justice to be seen in this country in over a decade. It would be 11 years before she would take that much deserved seat on a bus and refuse to get up, but she was an activist long before that. A few facts that you might not know about Rosa. Rosa Parks was never meek. She wasn't a middle class lady. She wasn't a church lady. She had had a long life history full of being rebellious from the time she was very young. She was not passive. When she would be challenged, why do you engage in such behavior? Why do you protest? Why do you push for these people? She would say, why do you all push us around and steal our bodies? Why do you treat us any way you want to? So in the 50s, when she resisted that seat on the bus, that was not her first act of resistance. Women on the buses had been abused by drivers for years. Her goal for years had been to end that abuse and to end all oppressions. So when you see that photo of her when she's arrested after refusing to sit on the bus, that's not her first arrest photo. But we don't know that about Rosa Parks. That's not the history we hear. We hear her portrayed as that meek middle class church lady who decided one day out of the blue that she just wasn't going to take it anymore. Rosa, Park, Rosa Parks dedicated her whole life to, to not being quiet, not being meek and mild. So she got very involved in the Reese Taylor case and even though the victim and the friends involved could identify the assailants and the sheriff knew them, everyone knew them, they were brought in, uh, there was a huge campaign, they were never charged. But we, the important thing to take away from this, and of course Reese Taylor endured lives of threats and harassment in the aftermath of that as well. But what this tells us that in truth the Montgomery boy, bus boycott that followed was not just a protest against racial intolerance and racial violence, it was a protest against rape and sexual assault as well. And Rosa Parks' arrest on December 1st in 1955 was but one act in a long life dedicated to the protection and defense of black people and black women specifically. Now a nice kind of um, sequel to this story is that on Mother's Day in 2011, the Alabama House of Representatives informed Reese Taylor, then 93, she's still alive today, they gave her a written apology, a formal apology from the House of Representatives and the Abbeville mayor for their failure to bring her attackers to justice. Hopefully bringing one terrible tragic story in our history to some resolution. Um, so I think that's a powerful story. We need to know about Reese Taylor. We need to celebrate Reese Taylor in this movement and we need to celebrate Rosa Parks as an anti-rape activist. There were many stories like this and all these stories during this time and Rosa Parks herself said the 1940s were a very rough time in Montgomery and in Alabama. Nobody knew what to do. There was so much white on black violence. So these cases are just spilling over and spilling over in the 40s. Another case of Gertrude Perkins, I'm going to mention a few of these just because they have particular relevance, you know, kind of particular milestones. Um, Gertrude Perkins was a 25-year-old black woman who was raped by two police officers. Notice how often it is people in authority and positions of authorities with weapons that are engaging in these activities. Um, Gertrude was stopped walking home from a party. They took her outside of town and had, quote, unquote, all manner of sexual relations with her uh, and dumped her in the road. And she immediately went to her minister and they immediately went to the police. When the authorities made it clear that they were not going to respond, to Perkins' assault, local NAACP activists and labor leaders and ministers in the community formed an umbrella organization called Citizens for Justice for Gertrude Perkins. Again, Rosa Parks is one of the local activists who demanded an investigation and trial and helped maintain these public protests for several months. Again, there was no verdict in the case, but it was a galvanizing case and it brought together for the first time local clergy and local businessmen black and white together and becoming more or, more organized and more focused on their mission and their goals. So it really was a, a movement changer. There was a movement going on in 1940 in the South to try to respond to the rape and assault of people of color. There was a movement. We need to recognize that. Black women were leading the movement. Flossie Hartman, just another case. The Perkins protest 
didn't happen in isolation. Uh, Flossie Hartman, 1951, she was a 15-year-old black girl. She worked for a local grocer, uh, Sam Green. He would frequently give her rides home in the evening. He, she would sometimes babysit for his children and he would take her home after that. One night, instead of taking her home, he drove her to the woods and raped her. She immediately went home. She told her family. And there was a large campaign that was organized, partly built on the organizing structure that had been formed in the Gertrude Perkins case before it. In response to this campaign, the black community, well again, the jury found surprisingly Green was not guilty. It took them all of five minutes to fully deliberate that, to return a not guilty verdict. But in response, the community for the first time organized a boycott of Sam Green's grocery store. And suddenly, within just a matter of weeks, blacks had given their own verdict in this trial and had successfully closed down his store. So this sent a very loud message in their community that white men were not going to get away with raping black women, that there would be consequences for that. And this was with gathering larger and larger support from the white community. Really important for us to keep this in mind. The community was organizing. And we have to remember this all throughout the 50s. Black women, not just in Alabama, but there was a lot of organizing going on in the South because that's where the focus of so much oppression was following the Civil War and the rise of the Jim Crow laws. Um, but across the country, black women were speaking out and organizing against rape and people of color. One of my favorite um, groups that was organized, it was short-lived, but it was called Sojourners for Truth and Justice. Um, it was short-lived, but in, I think an important black women's organization that was dedicated to the quote-unquote full dignity of black women's womanhood. And it was rooted in the black radical feminist tradition of resistance. Um, and they gathered in 1951, this group gathered hundreds of women of color to march on Washington, D.C. to testify and bear witness about the sexual assaults that they were experiencing. So there was a march on Washington, quote unquote, in the 50s that I certainly had never heard of. Um, so it continues. Now, this is a really, really big case. And I, I have heard of, I've heard this name, but I really have never known the full story behind this case. Um, Betty Jean Owens was a Florida A&M student. She was raped by four white men. They were immediately arrested, but they were cocky. They didn't take it seriously. They all laughed. They immediately confessed to the crime, saying, quote, unquote, we just raped a couple of niggers. So Florida A&M students organized a huge rally and protest against this, this assault, and it gained pretty wide coverage nationally. She testified again at a trial. Um, and amazingly, all four men were convicted, and all four men received a life sentence. So this was a first in the South and around the country, and it was a civil rights watershed moment. It helped to end the conspiracy around the country around the white rape and sexual violence against black women that has been rooted and continues to be rooted in slavery. But it was this pattern of hidden rapes throughout these decades that really helped fuel the civil rights movement. But again, the analysis of this is frequently omitted. And most importantly, our own movement has done little to highlight these contributions and these organized efforts against sexual assault. So black women, long before white women stood up, recognized that this was always about more than a seat on the bus. By the 1950s, there was a history of sexual assaults on black women, and the use of the boycott was becoming a really powerful weapon for justice, and it laid the groundwork for what was to come. Given that what they had been engaged in in the 50s and the success that they had had, it only made sense that city buses served as a focal point for mass protest because it was so frequently the site of African Americans being harassed. In 1953 alone, just in Montgomery, Alabama, there were partially, largely thanks to the work of women of color, Rosa Parks and others, 
there were over 30 formal complaints, many, many, many more informal complaints that never reached um, the level of full complaint, but there were over three dozen formal complaints about abuse on the buses, most from working class women, mainly domestic workers who made up 70% of the bus ridership. Um, the drivers would hurl insults, they would flash themselves at them, they would grab them and touch them inappropriately, physically and sexually abuse them. 1949, one of, one of Rosa Parks' neighbors, Joan Robinson, suffered a particularly humiliating experience on an almost empty bus when the driver, driver ordered her off uh, for having the nerve to sit in the wrong seat on the bus. He ordered her off and sexually assaulted her behind the bus by the side of the road, put her back on the bus where she belonged in her proper seat and then dumped her off um, a little ways down the road. Um, well, in 1954, Joanne Robinson, who is in this picture that you see in front of you, was the leader of the Women's Political Council and other people, including Rosa Parks, um, began to talk about a boycott of Montgomery City buses. And they used the infrastructure that they had established in their movement to respond to rape victims. They used that infrastructure that they had established after months of efforts to try to get city officials to address the problem of violence against women, they began to talk about organizing this bus boycott. So Parks and the women who organized during this time fought for a lot more than the seat on the bus. They knew they were fighting not just for racial justice, but for sexual justice and liberation and freedom. They demanded the right to move through the world without being molested, and they fought against police brutality and racial and sexual violence. Wow, does that have a ring for today, right? We could use a Rosa Parks right now. We could use an Ida B. Wells right now. So a lot of what we know after this is what we commonly, or what is presented is what is I generally share uh, in my presentations about what is going on, what went on in the Civil Rights Movement. And we know in the Civil Rights Movement during this time that the second wave of feminists was started, the Civil Rights Movement was galvanizing a lot of activity, and so it kind of provided a, a platform, excuse me, a platform or an opportunity once again for people to get involved. But w when we talk about this, when I as a white person and trainer have stood up and talked about this, I don't acknowledge and recognize that it grew out of organized resistance that women of color had already been engaging in for 60s. Um, so it's no surprise that the women's movement of the 60s and 70s was deeply divided, not only between young and old and upper class and lower class, but also between white and black. Another person that we frequently omit, and who, you know, I have omitted her, and she's one of my favorite people because she grew up not too far from where I lived, Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer, and this was during our movement. Remember, our movement is, is, is rolling here. We're starting to galvanize. We're starting to come together. Fannie Lou Hamer, Hamer was integral in this because she, um, in 1964, spoke out loud on a national podium at the Democratic National Convention talking about how a black woman's body was never her own. She was protesting the sexual violence of people of color and sharing, sharing her own experiences of being raped in Mississippi when she was working on voting rights campaign and being savagely beaten and raped by officers of the jail. Fannie Lou Hamer, as a young girl, uh, went to a doctor for a cyst in her stomach and subsequent, subsequently was subjected to a full hysterectomy without her consent or understanding um, at the age, uh, what we would consider too young to consent to that. So she learned a very early age that a, woman's, a black woman's body was never her own and continued to learn that as she was sexually assaulted, harassed, uh, threatened with all kinds of violence as she worked for voter registration laws and in anti-lynching campaigns. She was arrested for eating at a white-only lunch counter um, in Winona, Mississippi, and she and a group of other uh, activists were brutally, brutally beaten, and they spoke out about this sexual violence um, that occur was occurring rampantly in southern jails. They spoke out about this in the Democratic Convention. In 1964, that was a woman speaking out on a big 
big platform. Rosalie Coates, uh, again, this, you know, yet another black teenager um, was ad abducted and raped in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, this was a milestone because a man named Norman Cannon was arrested and he was prosecuted and he was convicted. Um, it was, it, you know, again, it's, it's referred to frequently as a milestone, but the story is never really told. These are stories of real people who spoke out and stood up and who were involved in some of the first, most successful prosecutions for sexual assault that we have ever seen. And in a time when we're really not winning any awards for prosecuting sexual assault, I'm confused and disappointed and mystified why we would leave this out of our history. Um, another thing, and I don't have a slide, and this is a, it's something that you know, one of the reasons I, Sarah and I here, Sarah in my office, and I've been laughing about my creating this PowerPoint because it's taken me forever. And one reason is because every time I do it, and still as I do it now, I, I realize I have to go do it. I have to go do it again because I have to keep getting my whitewash out of it. I have to keep going back and going, no, you keep putting your own white overlay on this. There's more to it than this. This is not the right story. This is not the full story. And one of the things that I really recently became aware of that I think needs to be included that I don't have included is how important the 1967 Loving decision was, L-O-V-I-N-G, after Mildred Loving, who was a black woman who was angry that she was forced to leave her home state of Virginia because she could not marry a black man. Because up until 1967, interracial marriage was still outlawed. Outlawed, I'm sorry. But I realize how important it is, partly after reading Daniel McGuire's book and then doing some other research, that you really cannot look at the Loving decision with and looking at you know the implications that it has for black women's bodily integrity. You can't look at the whole history of our movement without including this, I think, because all racial and sexual violence that we recognize really is based on this held belief that the races could not intermingle, that we had to keep the white race pure. And that was really used to justify and substantiate um, the protection of black women um, from white men because we didn't want to mix the races. So white men had to protect their women, black men had to protect their women. So if those women were violated, it was their duty to fight out. It was their responsibility to fight out to keep the races, to fight back to keep the races pure. So the Loving decision was really big because the Supreme Court of our country said it is okay for the races to intermingle. So I think that is really a significant uh, milestone that needs to be included in our history as well. So again, we know we talk about, from a white perspective, we talk about consciousness raising groups of the 60s as the first, and I've said this for years, the first support groups. We commonly consider these the first support groups for women. Safe places that they could finally talk about rape. Really? Really? Daisy Bates, Rosa Parks, all those black club women, Ida B. Wells, all those people were not creating safe places for women to come together and share their experiences. I think that 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 little bit of history needs to be updated and, and rewritten. So even when I look back at my own work, I come to the screen and go, whoa, wait a second, this is a little whitewash. Let's, sh let's show the full thing that was going on here. Yes, women of color were getting together in groups. I'm sorry, white women were getting, middle class white women were getting together for some of the first times that any of those women had ever done that to talk about their relationships and instances of sexual violence. But it was not the first time women had gotten together to share their stories and to try to talk about solutions and options for what they could do. So we need to be really clear about that and clarify that. But we do know that in the 60s that and 70s, it's when our formal rape crisis movement became more organized. So we know about that. We talk about the early origin of the movements in the 70s, um, share the history. 
of some of the things that happened in Chicago. But again, generally not including all the other history that went on in Chicago in the late part of the uh, 19th century and early part of the 20th century. And again, even as our movement is building in the 70s, we still, even though there was national attention at the time brought to some of these ongoing stories, we don't include them. I'm vaguely aware of these people's names, but I've never known their stories. I never knew exactly what happened. I never knew why it was important. And I, more importantly, I never knew that thousands of people were marching and speaking out about these things at the time, but yet I haven't included that until just this year in my history. Why is that? I'm going to answer that question at the end, or one thing I think is the answer that that thing is complicated, obviously. But so cases go on that, you know, we're, we're fighting out, we're galvanizing a formal movement, but these incidences keep happening and keep happening. Inez Garcia was um, a woman, Hispanic woman, Latina woman in Monterey, California, who killed her rapist and was subsequently charged and convicting. And it promoted widespread pro this case her lawyer used a diminishing, diminished capacity defense because they did recognize the mental trauma of rape, but they argued that that mental trauma contributed to her diminished capacity so that she really wasn't able to defend herself or fight off because she had been mentally damaged. So she was. She ended up being. That didn't fly. The argument didn't fly. She ended up being convicted. There were again widespread protests. Um, you can see some of the protests on the screen here. Um, but feminists did organize, largely feminist, feminists of color, largely the Latin community, Latina community in California, um, but um, some other people of color and white people, white allies. They. Uh, galvanized. They found a new attorney. They got a feminist attorney named Susan Jordan. They were able to retry the case, and she used a simple self-defense argument. Um, and eventually, years later, like a decade later, that conviction was that conviction was eventually overturned, and she was acquitted. Um, again, this case galvanized a growing movement of young activists to expose sexual violence as a tool of sexism and oppression. Um, and including uh, the oppression of women of color, but we don't include this in the history um, of our movement. Marge History wrote a poem that you might want to look up. It's called For Inez Garcia. So she became a part of the regular, um, you know, culture, at least in, in literary and women's circles, but the story somehow began to be omitted from the history that we share. Similarly, Joanne Little, um, Joanne Little had always had a history of run-ins with the law for petty things like shoplifting and uh, petty thievery. Uh, she was in Washington, North Carolina. She was an African-American woman. She was prosecuted in 1974 for the murder of a white prison guard um, after she had been in prison for some of her petty offenses. She was the first woman in history to be acquitted using the defense of deadly force to resist sexual assault. So this focused natural, national attention on a woman's right to defend herself against rape. And for the first time, a court said that she or ruled or considered that she did have that right to defend herself in a case of sexual assault. So this is a milestone case. This is a milestone event. It galvanized largely the black community, but a community response that ended up, um, you know, gaining national attention. So these cases are there, but they get omitted. They're not included. And why is that? We have to ask ourselves. Why do we not know about Yvonne Wanro, who was a young African American? Um, I'm sorry, I just switched my on the wrong page here. She was a Native American woman who, in 1972, um, shot a man to death. Why? Because he was in the process of trying to rape her son. She was a Native American woman. Um, she initially confessed. She thought that she was 
certainly, uh, if not in the right, at least in a good position of defending herself, the right to defend herself, because she saw the man raping her son and pulled him off and ended up killing him. She appealed the case to the Washington Supreme Court, uh, partly on the backs of the women's movement at the time and the fledgling anti-rape movement who was trying to galvanize support for her. Um, the conviction eventually was reduced to manslaughter and she received probation and community service. In the appeal, the judge declared that she was entitled to have a jury consider her actions in the light of her perceptions of the situation and that those perceptions are the product of our nation's long and unfortunate history of sex discrimination. That was written in his decision. So this outcome had far-reaching legal effects on the manner in which juries interpret the behavior of a defendant, and yet we have little information about that. So we have to, excuse me, so we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Why is that that we don't know about these cases? Desi Woods, anyone ever heard of this woman? Young African American woman. <clears throat> excuse me. The black nationalists, I both get too much talking, I get, you know, all kind of choked up, but I get choked up about this material. I really do. I don't understand why we don't know about these stories, about Desi Woods, who was convicted of voluntary manslaughter after she killed the man who tried to rape her. Thanks to a large black nationalist movement at the time, they formed a national committee to defend her. They allied with white organizations who were slow to respond, but who eventually joined the campaign and worked for years to try to gain her appeal and her parole. Eventually, she won her hard sought freedom, but only after five years, and the judge, after all of that, said there was never evidence to pursue the case from the first place. None of this would have ever happened without a movement that was built on the backs of black women that was built on the backs of slaves, that was built on the back of people who had for decades been standing up, speaking out, and fighting back. I think it's important to share those stories. I think we need to include them in our own history because they, much of it happened here among us. We know it did. We tell the stories about Take Back the Nine and women speaking out. We talk about all the progress we've made, and we have made so much progress. And of course, in the 1980s, and this was good, this work that the 1980s came along in the 1980s when more and more research was created, it was good. It bolstered our movement. But we also need to recognize, look at the women on this screen. These are white, and I'm sure they know this, these are white privileged women who were able, because of their privilege, to go to school, get degrees, do research. And their research, finally, in the 1980s, gave us enough quote unquote status and legitimacy to be able to grow and build our movement to where it is today. I don't think that it should have taken that long, and I don't think it should have to depend on white privileged women. And we are partly responsible that, for that in this movement. 1991, Anita Hill. We don't, I, I don't know that our movement has ever embraced Anita Hill. I have never talked about in any way that really gives cre credit to her sacrifice what Anita Hill. And Anita Hill in 1991, when she spoke in front of Congress speaking out against Clarence Thomas and his sexual harassment of her, that was a courageous, incredibly courageous do. That was a milestone in changing the sexual assault laws in this country. And, you know, we have some rooms named 
for different folks around ICASA office. We don't have a room name for her. We don't have a room name for Ida B. Wells. We don't have any plaques or any monuments that I see anywhere for Anita Hill. So I think we, we need to take responsibility for that. Has our movement embraced her? Because she changed sexual harassment and the way people look at sexual harassment. That never would have happened if she hadn't had the courage to stand up there and talk. So again, you know, this history is just the recent history that, you know, we continue, the activism continues, but what activism gets told? What activism is shared? What activism do we include in our stories? And do we include the activism of all of us? Because what we know throughout history from day one, from the first time a former slave woman in 1866 at the age of 16 spoke up about being raped in Memphis, Tennessee, we know that stories are the only thing that ever really make change, the voices of victims. So we have to make sure that all the voices of victims are included. And I guess I just want to sort of wrap this up, not to belabor it, although I probably already have, but it's our responsibility to include these stories. And my answer to why, look at all these women, I love this slide, look at all these women that have come forward in the last year, 18 months, two years, and absolutely more women of color. But, you know, I, I love this story. We didn't hear that much about this particular woman woman in front of the screen here, Janie, um, in Oklahoma City, who was one of the many black women who were raped by a serial rapist. And she finally said, he just picked the wrong woman. I wanted to make sure this didn't happen again. And she spoke up, and she ended up leading to his arrest and conviction. And it would never would have happened if people don't speak up. So my answer, why do we not, why did I never know all this history? Why did, and I read this book in 2016 by Danielle McGuire, and it had been out for six years, and I never even heard of it. And I, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. I've never heard any mention of it. Why is that? And it's a complicated answer. I recognize that. But one of the answers is, because we don't have enough women of color involved in our work. We don't have enough people of color in leadership positions. We don't have enough people of color in this office. We don't have enough people of color in your programs. We don't have everybody at the table. We have to correct that. And every one of us are responsible for that if that doesn't happen. When we're not representing all of our stories, we can't address all of our needs. And if all of our lives matter, then the stories of black women matter too. And the stories of black rape victims matter too. The story of all people matter, but we're not including their stories. We're not including them in the history we share. We're not even including and acknowledging them, acknowledging them in what they have contributed and sacrificed for us. I think those stories bear being told. That, that's my goal today. I hope that it is something that resonates with you in some place, on some level, and that you ask yourself, what can we do about that? What can I do about that? One of the mistakes I have made in the last, within the last year as I've been researching more about the civil rights movement and the history of activism uh, around the country and in places that I have lived and where I grew up, I keep asking myself, what would I have done if I had been Sarah Grimke in that time? What would I have done if I had been of age when I was Fannie Lou Hamer? What would I have done if I was Reese Taylor? What would I have done if I was Rosa Parks? And then I turn on the news, I pick up the paper, and I realize we're in the middle of a civil rights movement right now, right outside our window, right outside our door. What am I doing now? The first thing I can do is contribute to a retelling of the history. That's what I'm doing this, at this moment. But what am I going to do when we all get off this webinar? What are you all going to do?
that's what I leave you with. That's what I offer you to think about. And Well, I hope you got an interesting history lesson and some helpful information for our event today. Uh, you'll be able to view it later or recommend others to view it uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. I just want to give you a little tidbit uh, about the services that the Women's Center offers. All our services are free and confidential. Uh, we have safe shelter, legal advocacy, adult and child individual and group counseling, case management services, transitional housing, group support, emergency food and supplies, referral services, transportation, and activities for women and children. And those things follow up under our domestic violence and shelter program. Under rape crisis services, we assist adult and children survivors of sexual assault and sexual abuse, male or female, and their significant others. Services include emotional support, legal and medical advocacy, and individual or group counseling. We also have a 24-hour crisis hotline, and we provide support at the hospital emergency rooms and police departments. We provide public education, professional training, and prevention programs on a variety of topics related to sexual assault. We also have volunteer opportunities. Uh, the Women's Center could not function without the dedicated assistance of many of its volunteers. They work in the shelter, assist residents, handle hotline calls, offer in-person crisis intervention, work with children, provide transportation, perform clerical duties and serve on committees. Those with time and enthusiasm to give may contact the Women's Center at 618-549-4807, extension 232 for more information. We also have community programs such as institutional advocacy on behalf of all survivors, support group, clothing pantry, emergency food and supplies, and uh, referrals for legal matters such as divorce. We have public education prevention programs, including a self-defense program for adults and children, professional training programs addressing domestic violence and sexual assault. We also are involved in the community and many social justice activities. Again, we have a 24 hour information and crisis hotline. That number is 1-800-334-2094 or 618-529-2324. Please don't hesitate to call us if you need assistance. Some of our upcoming events is the Take Back the Night, which is tomorrow from 7 to 9 p.m. 5.30 to 6.30, we'll be creating posters and art at the Women's Center. From there, we will walk to the Gaya House from 6.30 to 7. At 7 o'clock, the March to Carbondale Pavilion will begin. 7.30 to 9.30, we'll have snacks and speakers. If you need more information, check our Facebook or call 618-549-4807. We also have a Mother's Day Poetry Summit coming up, May 6th from 6 p.m. Virtual poetry event at Open Mic. Bring a point to share on the subject of mothers or on the subject of Mother's Day. And you can register at Carbondale Public Library org. I'd like to thank our sponsors, which is Carbondale United, the Women's Center, uh, Carbondale Public Library, and uh, many other social service groups. Our contact information 
You can contact Carbondale United at carbondaleunited15 at gmail.com or on Facebook, Create a Better Community. The Women's Center's 24-hour crisis hotline, again, is 1-800-334-2094. And thank you for attending.